Okay. Today we're looking at uh, a fella called Doeg. Uh, this this fella is um, one you don't want to recognise any of his traits in your own life. If you have uh, any recognition, then uh, <laughs> that's a focus that you need to uh, place pretty heavily right now and uh, do something about. Uh, not a nice character. And uh, we're going to read about him in 1 Samuel 21. Uh, before that, I'm just going to bring you up to date with uh, what's been happening. Uh, Saul knows that his kingdom is going to be uh, ripped from him. Uh, God has rejected him as his king. And uh, largely because of Saul's presumptuousness, um, where he refused to wait for Samuel to appear um, uh, after defeating the, um, uh, what's the king? I'm trying to think of one of their enemies anyway. Agag, I think, was the name of the king. I, and I can't think of the name of, of his people. But anyway, um, he, uh, he didn't kill him and he didn't uh, follow God's orders uh, to destroy all the, the livestock. He kept the best livestock because he was going to offer it uh, to God as a sacrifice. That might not seem in itself uh, a problem, but uh, when God gives strict instructions, they need to be strictly adhered to. And uh, that was uh, Saul's failing um, because he uh, didn't also uh, wait for um, someone who's qualified uh, uh, to, to offer sacrifices and went and offered them himself, which wasn't his role. Uh, presumptuousness uh, proved to be uh, deadly. <laughs> uh, and it certainly was the reason that God uh, gave Saul uh, an evil spirit, is what most translations say, to, to harass him. Um, and uh, one of the episodes that follows involves David uh, nearly getting pinned to a wall with a with Saul's spear. Uh, it happened more than once to David, and it even happened to Jonathan, one of Saul's own sons. So that gives you an indication of um, how, what would you call uh, someone who you're never quite sure whether you're safe around? Um, you know, you could be fine one minute and then suddenly uh, he could just totally erupt into, you know, crazed anger. Um, a bit of a, a bit psychotic, <laughs> yeah, maybe, psychotic. Uh, you might think, psychopath. But that's that evil spirit uh, that refused. Uh, I mean, David was actually there on one, one occasion playing a harp to try and soothe him uh, from this, uh, this, this issue. Um, but... He was a dangerous man to be around. And so this occasion causes David to flee for his life. Okay? Uh, with the clothes on his back and the sandals on his feet, that was about it. He didn't have time to gird up his weapons and any belongings. And he flees to the city of Nob, which at that time, when the tabernacles in Shiloh, Nob is a, a city in Benjamin, I think, that uh, uh, is where the priests live. So not too far away from uh, um, from where Saul is. Um, and David goes to the priest Ahimelech. And we're going to read uh, chapter 21. I'll read from uh, verse 1. Uh, first Samuel. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David trembling. And he said to him, why are you alone and not no one with you? David said to Himalayan the priest, when he says no one with you, it doesn't mean there was no one with David, but it means that he wasn't you know, leading his army and he wasn't in the attire that you'd expect David to travel in. Yeah? Uh, and that was causing a Himalayan to tremble. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look at why that might be later. Um, and David says, uh, the king has charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I've made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. 
And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women, and David answered the priest, truly, women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, in other words, set apart, even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? And I think that might suggest to us what day of the week it is. We'll say something about that again in a moment. So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, that's the shoe bread, that would be placed in the, uh, the holy place, in, you know, the holy place in the tabernacle for a week, um, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Well, which day of the week do you reckon that would be? The day it's taken away? The day it's changed over would be the Sabbath, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I think we're talking so about or right before the Sabbath because they're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. Right. The well them. the priests are doing oh, things on the Sabbath and Sabbath. they're held guiltless for it. I mean okay. Jesus said so. But, but um yeah. So it, it that's about the time we're talking about. And I think that's important in deducing some things that are, are, are going on here. Um, but let's read on. Now, a certain man, verse 7, of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, interesting term. His name was Doeg, the Edomite. And I think the fact that he's uh, Doeg, the Edomite, uh, is also interesting as well. Uh, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Himalek, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand, a weapon? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that, give it to me. Well, you can imagine the size of that sword. You think a Scottish broadsword thing, and then this thing mm -hmm. would be huge, and it would take quite a skilled person to be able to use it. So um, that kind of introduces uh, our lesson today. Um, I think it's the Sabbath for the reason I've just stated about the bread, uh, but also um, because we're told that Doeg the Edomite, who is, what's his position in Saul's court, if you will? Shepherd. shepherd. Yeah, he's the chief shepherd, or chief herdsman. <coughs> so what would he be in charge of? Why would he be going to the priests of Nol, you think? Sell some sheep. Oh, 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 well. Supplying sacrifices. sacrifices. Yeah. yeah, the king's duty was to provide certain amounts of sacrifice, certainly the sacrifices for the priesthood to offer. And they had to offer sacrifices daily, didn't they? Every morning, the uh, altar of burnt offering was, uh, they were to offer sacrifices and every evening the fires were never to go out on the altar of burnt offering. Okay, now there were other, plenty of other offerings that they offered on there for individuals and for um, maybe the king or who, whoever, but, but the priesthood uh, was responsible for offering uh, certain sacrifices for, for themselves as a priesthood. Um, and also it was a mark that uh, when the when people woke up and saw the, uh, the smoke ascending from the uh, altar of burnt offering first thing in the morning, um, we're told that, that uh, the fat that was burnt of the burnt offering is how is it described? Do you remember in the Old Testament? It's how Christians are described in Second Corinthians oh, chapter about, two. Oh, is that somewhat in reference when we talk about the aroma of Christ? Yeah, the sweet really? aroma. Yeah, it's just the burn burning of the fat is a sweet aroma. In Hebrew, the word is olam, and the olam is a, a, a sweet smelling aroma to to God. And, and what it talks. What it represents, what does the burnt offering represent, you remember? The whole burnt offering represents dedication, um, sanctification, setting oneself apart for God. 
Well, it's important that the priesthood does that. Mm -hmm. If the priesthood is setting itself apart to do God's work, which is their ministry, then uh, it's uh, an example to be followed by the people as well. It's a, it's a reminder to them of Israel's unique covenant situation with God as a people. So that's actually very important. Well, why would Doeg be detained? What, what, what does that word mean? Why would he have to wait there uh, at the city of Nob for the priests? Well, he wouldn't be able to get the priests. What was one of the functions of the priesthood when someone uh, brought sacrifice to them, a lamb to them? What was the first thing that they had to do? Before they could offer the sacrifice. Before they could kill it, they had to they had to check it, make sure it was no pure. Yeah, no blemishes, no illness, no blind. Sure, kind of livestock inspection. Yeah, well, <laughs> you can't do livestock inspection on uh, Sabbath. So Doeg turned up with the stuff and the priests are not doing inspections that day because they are, it's, already it's Sabbath. Sabbath, it's dedication day. So uh, that would explain probably why um, Doeg's detained there. He's got to wait. Okay. Um, do you reckon Doeg uh, is a religious guy himself? Tell me why they said that you <laughs> well, yeah, okay, and if well, he showed up on the Sabbath, then he obviously didn't respect the Sabbath. Right. What What do you What do you know? What do you remember about Eden? I don't remember Who was the founder of the the, the nation state of Eden? That was a Esau. Yeah. Yeah. So Esau was its uh, sort of patriarch. Um, what else do you know about Eden and its history? Go back to numbers and the, the wilderness wanderings of Israel. What happened when they came to the borders of Eden, which kind of was between them and the promised land? Yeah, they didn't get along with the uh, Israelites. Yeah, they, the king refused to let them even travel on the king's highway, which they said they would stay on, and if they took any food or needed anything, they would pay the king for it, and, you know, that he wouldn't be, it wouldn't cost him anything to let them go through. The king refused to give them passage across his land and forced them to have to go all the way up and round the Dead Sea because they weren't allowed to go into Philistia, okay? So it was a big holdup for, for Israel, and uh, God was not very pleased with Edom either uh, for, for doing that, because they were what to Israel as a nation? They were like Moab and Ammon. Yeah, they were. They were blood kin, if you will. Yeah. Yeah? Um, Moab and Ammon are named yeah, after no, the sons, yeah. of, uh, sons of Lot's daughters. Really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Eden, Moab, and Ammon had a, a, a stronger, should have had a better relationship with uh, Israel than, than any of the other nations, certainly Philistia or mm. Egypt. But, but they tended to um, grate on each other a lot, didn't they, in their history? Maybe so, they were jealous of the Israelites. Jealous of Israel. Hey, just so I'm like, you know, those. You know those second, third cousins over there that are just like, I'm sure. yeah. <laughs> which is kind of interesting because yeah. uh, Ruth was a which she was the Ammonite, wasn't she? Either Ammonite or Moabite. I, so. I, I can't remember one of the two, but it's kind of there's interesting. No there's no fighting like family. <laughs> <laughs> and, and during this time, uh, with in chapter 22, uh, the beginning there, when um, David uh, get, gets his parents and he takes them to the king of Moab and leaves them with him in verse 4 which is interesting that, that he believes they, they would be safer there with the king of Moab than they would be uh, in, in Israel so because he doesn't trust Saul but he also doesn't trust Saul's henchmen um, so Edom has a very uh tainted relationship let's put it that way 
later on in its history, uh, when Jeremiah is prophet and Nebuchadnezzar's destroying Jerusalem and some people flee out of Jerusalem and go towards Eden, what will the Edomites do? They will capture them and send them back to Nebuchadnezzar. So that's not a very nice thing to do either, is it? So they, they have a tortuous history. Obadiah, the uh, shortest of the prophets, not in stature but in uh, length, uh, he, he is uh, issuing curses to Eden uh, as well about their forthcoming destruction, uh, which, which took place um, probably during the, that 400 year quiet period uh, when the Greeks are in control. Anyway, so um, I want you to just keep your finger in First Samuel. Uh, let's uh, take a quick look at Psalm 52. Well, no, actually, find Psalm 52. Let, let's hold off going there just yet, because I, I want to read the rest of the deal about uh, Doeg. Um, so far, we've just seen that... The, David acknowledges that Doeg is there, and he's kind of wary of his presence. Well, what do you think? Yeah, because David knows <laughs> David knows Doeg. This isn't the first time that they've ever met. Anyway, um, it it may be the reason why David uh, doesn't tell the truth to Ahimelech about his reason for being there. I suspect if Doeg hadn't have been lurking around with his people, uh, that um, he might have told him that and like the truth that I'm actually on the running for my life. You know, can you just give me what you've got so I can get out of here? Um, but that that's open to um, you know, interpretation. Let's jump forward to uh, chapter twenty-two. Okay. Um, I'm going to find that. Well, I'm going to read from verse 6. Where are you now? 22? Yeah. Now Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah, which is in Benjamin. That's his sort of uh, royal city, if you will. Under the tamarisk tree on the high, with uh, his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? That all of you who have conspired against me, no one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. That would be Jonathan, yes? None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as of this day. And then answered Doeg the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul, I saw the son of Jesse, and the son of Jesse is, uh, it's not a very nice way of saying David, is it? It's kind of a derogatory expression that you can imagine when he says that, that's son of Jesse. Um, I, I saw him, coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahito. And he inquired, Ahimelech did, inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Is that true? Is that statement all true? Well, they gave him victuals, and gave him the sword. That's a good English term. Well, he did, did inquire. Of the Lord. Did he inquire of the Lord? Oh, no. Well, he didn't. He didn't inquire of the Lord for him, and that's very significant because if you inquire of the Lord for someone, that typically is for the king. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't say that. He so it would it stuff. would suggest to us that uh, what Doeg is doing here is that asking. For or God's guidance? Is that what that means? What does that mean? Inquire. Well, it could do, but it could also be uh, he's asking in an imprecatory way that uh, God destroy Saul. 
Now you've got to imagine and you've got to kind of know the, the personality of Doeg. Doeg's an opportunist, okay? He's there lighting a fire under Saul. Under he wants to get him angry, okay? Because Doeg doesn't really care about anybody other than Doeg. Uh, he's out to um, get himself as powerful as, as he can. Um, and I'm going to go to Psalm 52 in a moment because what uh, David says, um, and remember David is a prophet, so what he's speaking is through the Holy Spirit. It's kind of interesting about, uh, about doing. Anyway, let's just read on a second here. Um, verse 11, then the king sent to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahito, and all his father's hands. So that's all of the family of priests, yeah? Mm -hmm. The priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahito. Um, and he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me? So that tells you what Saul understands from what Doeg said to him about uh, right. David inquiring of, um, of the high priest, okay? Because when he wears that ephod, the priest gets to be able to um, be a prophet as well, mm -hmm. in, in some respects. Um, and Saul said to him, sorry, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as his as at this day. And then Ahimelech answered the king, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David? David, who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honoured in your house? Surely it's David, isn't it? Look at the positions you've given him. To be head of his bodyguard would imply what? Extreme trust. Yeah, the greatest trust that there is. So... You know, what Ahimelech says there is, is absolutely true. Now well, he's saying he had, had no reason to doubt. When David came and said, I'm on business for the king. Yeah. This is the he day that no I know. reason. He didn't have any reason to think David wouldn't be straight up. Right. Yeah. And I don't know that Doeg is aware of um, what David said to him. He, he would just see, seeing from a distance mm -hmm. that he was given provisions yeah. and, a, and a sword. Now, verse 15 in the ESV, I, I kind of have a problem with the way they've translated it because it's easily misunderstood. My version says, is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? Well, I don't know what your versions say, but you could. Mine says, what's that day? Is that day the first time? Right, okay. The, what is this one? I think this is the NIV. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Okay. They, they all suggest that I've done this before. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually don't think that's the right translation here. Uh, I, I kind of prefer the translation that suggests, have I ever inquired of God for him? Like I would the king. That would be... The no. way you could translate the NIV, did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Right. The question mark. As if he's the king? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, mine mine let, adds a question mark. It's yeah. not a statement. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all of this, much or little. So kind of in, in our vernacular, I think what he's saying there is, have I ever inquired of God for David as if he was the king? No. So why would I do it now? That's more or less what I think he's really trying to convey. That's what he's saying to Saul. In other words, I'm innocent of this. I don't understand all this palace intrigue that's been going on. I've not been, you know, I've not been party to it. Um, and, and he never told me that he fled here or anything from you he, he told me that he was on a uh, very important secret mission for you uh, you know so so that's where Ahimelech's coming from and the king said 
you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. So did Saul believe him or not? No. No, it doesn't seem so. Saul preferred to believe the we'll intrigue of Doeg. Saul was fantastically paranoid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course he's not going to believe it. Right. He was insecure. Can you think of any other people in history who've acted like this out of paranoia? Paranoid people are very dangerous when they get power. I mean, pick, pick one. Stalin. Mm -hmm. He had all his closest people killed. Herod. Yeah. Killed his own son. Well, they killed all the babies under two. Yeah. Well, yeah, but yes, but I mean, he killed yeah. people in his own family yeah. as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, those are good examples of extreme paranoia. Yeah. Yeah. Paranoid schizophrenic, really, mm -hmm. probably the way. You know, actually, actually, paranoid schizophrenics are much less harmful than paranoid authoritarians. Okay, yeah. Yeah, schizophrenics are usually not, not sure. organized enough in their thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, but Stalin definitely fits the bill. I, I would probably think that some people in North Korea and um, possibly uh, Mr. Mao, um, mm. you know, tends to be a trait that uh, even Hitler in his uh, later days, so... But yeah, there's been plenty of them in history. Um, what happens next is truly uh, terrible. Um, the king said to the guard who stood about him, turn, and that, that's his bodyguard, turn and kill the priests of the Lord because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. Well, that's the paranoia because they didn't know. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the law. Does that kind of remind you of a film that was, um, what was that film with? Uh, the Gladiator. Have you seen that film? Where they refused to kill him uh, when the king you know, put his finger and thumb down. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't kill him. Um, because the people were really... Sometimes the people evil. have... He'd been, his sense, general. Yeah. He'd been his closest bodyguard yeah. general, like a David figure, uh, in yeah. fact. People uh, have more sense than the king sometimes. Sometimes, uh, quite often times, actually. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, not a bit too much inbreeding in yeah. all families of uh, some countries. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so the guard, the bodyguard refuses to, um, to kill the priests. And I'm guessing it's a little bit more than just uh, because of uh, what they're being accused of here. You know, you got to think that these are honorable men. Yeah. You really are. They're honorable men. They're responsible men. They're also what? Well, but and, well, they're, they're they're Israelites, but and there's just not any way we're fixing to kill a bunch of priests. Okay, well, they're priests as well. I mean, who? What is the role of the priests? In, in Israel's They're covenant with, uh, God. with God. Yeah. They, they minister the sacrifices mm -hmm. for, for them. They also intercede for them in mm -hmm. prayer. Mm -hmm. So if you kill a whole family of, of those who serve in the tabernacle, who's right. going to serve in the tabernacle? Yeah. You wiped out the whole group that does that. Right. And if you can't serve in the tabernacle, it's kind of like destroying the temple, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's just you're destroying those who serve in the temple rather than the temple itself. So uh, what happens to uh, Israel's ability to be in covenant with God? And I think that is true, but I don't know. But just the sacrilege. Yeah. They're in there. They've heard all this. They've heard Abimelech say, I have a clue. Mm -hmm. They are priests of God. Yeah. These are devout men. I, I guess my point is these are devout Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. These like, are not a bunch. Well, and and and, and 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 so you get non devout men. You get the Edomites to do it, right? Because these guys are going. Wait a minute. That you're the king, but God is God, and these are his priests. Mm -hmm. I ain't. I ain't doing this. I ain't. This, I didn't sign up. For this. It'd be kind of like uh, today, uh, someone causing an intrigue in the church and suggesting that we um, disfellowship all the elders. And, and the they probably get those well. calls every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they make a decision that they don't like, and they're gone. 
Well, we are. Well, um, I didn't just say that for an accident. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean what I say. Yeah. Uh, that goes on more than you might yeah. expect. Uh, intrigues cause uh, things well, you, to you know, get this totally out of hand. Was it in here? For somebody, I quoted whatever two or three are gathered together in my name, there will be politics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you pin that on that? Um, so the priests refuse to do the king's bidding, okay, because they are the priests of the Lord God, Jehovah. And so, verse 18 the king said to Doeg, Now, I wonder why he turned to Doeg. Doeg doesn't care. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you really need to come to first service so you're up with the rest of us. <laughs> this is uh, this is what Dale talked about today about. Although well, I haven't been there. That's yet. what I mean. You need to come early. Uh, <laughs> because well, he, because he's going to talk about honoring things that are valuable. Yes. And who like um, only honored himself. Yes. And Doeg didn't care. And he didn't have a dog in that fight. He wasn't an Israelite. Right. His allegiance was to Saul. He had no allegiance to, to God that we know of. Right. I forgot to mention something else, something that a campaign that Saul had. Do you remember which country it was against? Early in Israel, it was against Edom. Yeah. So the author of this book here suggests that, and this is just a suggestion, it's not a, you know, he has nothing to back it up. But possibly Doeg was one of the people that was called was captured in the um, oh, and he changed sides against because Eden. that's kind of guy he is. right because he'll jump on whatever side yeah. uh, will save his skin and uh, will be best for Doeg. Uh, and that's certainly what's going on here. He doesn't mind if, uh, it, in fact, it serves his purpose and his nation's purpose very well if uh, Israel doesn't have a priesthood because if they're struggling in their covenant with God, that's good for Eden probably. But um, but anyway, I think that well, way, the other thing about it is he's, like you said, he's quoted this thing before Saul. Well, it's not going to go for well for him if later on it comes out that, you know what, that really kind of wasn't how it happened. He liked the king. So he might have been protecting himself. Yeah, it's kind of like, well, if we kill them all, nobody's around to say different. Yeah, what I said. So he's covering his, um, yeah. Okay, well, that would make sense as well. So the king said to Doeg, you turn and strike the priest. And Doeg, the Edomite, turned and struck down the priest, and he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. So they were all priests. And Nob, the city of the priests, he put it to the sword, both man, woman, child, and baby. Ox, donkey, sheep, he put to the edge of the sword. But one of the sons of the Himalayan, the son of Ahita, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew that he would surely tell Saul. He knew he couldn't trust that man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. It's, it's my fault, David said. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safe keeping. Okay. So, uh, a disastrous end uh, to that situation. Turn to um, Psalm 52. Because this is a psalm of David, and you'll note in the uh, in introductory uh, the heading, it says, To the choir master, a muscle of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Okay, so what's the subject matter of this psalm? It's very direct, isn't yeah. it? It's very specific. Okay, it's only a short psalm. Let, let's read it. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The first seven verses are imprecatory against uh, Doeg. What does that mean? It's a big word. It means that David is identifying and wishing uh, evil against a person 
but not that he should have the opportunity to exact it, but that God will uh, use his justice. Okay, that's really what implication is in, in the Psalms, and there's a good number of them where where David um, wishes evil on people, but he wishes it that God, please, will you uh, not ignore this and, and do something about it, so that your servant might be able to uh, do your bidding better in a more uh, holy way. So why do you boast of evil? How does it? What does he describe Doeg? As here, oh mighty man. Well, who were the mighty men? How else would you describe them? Give me a single word. Oh, okay, <clears throat> wasn't that a term for Saul's? No, David had his mighty men, but uh, uh, what were they? Well, they were his generals and his battle heroes, his warriors. Yeah, okay, so Doeg is a warrior. Okay, he's a, a man practiced in the art of, um, you know, fighting. He's a big guy, in other words. He knows how to take care of himself. All right. So why do you boast of evil, a mighty man, a mighty warrior? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all the words that devour a deceitful tongue. I mean, who, who else could he be describing yeah. here? You know, who was it? I mean, Doeg incites King Saul mm -hmm. uh, to destroy uh, the priesthood. Um, do you remember the, the story of Job? Yeah. What did God say to Satan on one of the times Satan came before him? He said, you incited me mm -hmm. to do harm to, yeah. to Job, to, you know, you, in fact, you wanted me to kill him, uh -huh. and I wouldn't let you. Mm -hmm. But you incited me because you said that I pampered Job, I put a hedge around him, yeah, a wall around him and protect him so that he's uh, protected in ways that the rest of the people aren't. Um, you know, that he's my favourite or something. That's incitement. That's what, uh, that, that's a characteristic of Satan. When he speaks, he speaks. When he speaks lies, he speaks his native tongue. Wasn't that what Jesus said about him to the, the Pharisees? And then who did he compare to Satan there on that occasion? He says, you Pharisees, you're the same. Yeah. Um, so there's a quite an accurate description there uh, of Doe. So he's a diabolical man. Yeah, that word uh, implies the uh, Latin for the devil, the other. Yeah, so diabolical speech, which is what Paul accuses a number of people of using in the New Testament, uh, very much describes this man here. Um, the righteous, sorry, uh, verse five, but God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Well, that would happen to uh, Doe, but it also happened, happened to Eden. The righteous shall see him fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See, the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his own riches and sought refuge in his own work of destruction, is one way that can be described. Okay? Uh, his own work of destruction. So it ended up destroying him in the end. But the last couple of verses describe David. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. That word steadfast love implies, um, it's a covenant term really. It implies the mercy of God. Okay? Um, and it's a long-suffering uh, mercy. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. So... Uh, that's an interesting insight. Quite often the Psalms provide additional insight. Um, you know, when you read of the, the historical Psalms of the, the wilderness wanderings, you, you learn some quite interesting things that you don't capture from the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. uh, it it's, it's sort of just gives a bit more of the picture. Um, 
So Doeg's a thoroughly objectionable guy, someone you want to be very, very wary of, which indeed David was as soon as he saw him lurking in the background. So, to generalise... He should have really gone and used Goliath's sword on him. Yeah, <laughs> should have just taken him out at the time. Uh, probably he wasn't on his own, he would have had a lot of yeah. people with him. Yeah. Uh, was it Scott Peck? Wrote um, the book People of the Lie? They might have been. And, you know, I mean, okay, to generalize uh -huh. and to kind of put this in maybe a modern context, mm. uh, I think of people a lot because there, there are people that uh, go into or and just go into fellowships and organizations and just blow them apart. Um, when I was in school, we, we, you know, have to take a course in learning all the different kinds of crazy people. And... Uh, Borderlands. Mm -hmm. And one of our professors said, Yeah, we made the mistake and hired a borderline as a secretary. Now, this is someone hired into a group of mental health professionals. Right. And said, and, and she blew the whole practice apart. And so the idea of somebody that comes in and lies and manipulates for themselves, and that's what people the lie talks about. Uh, can well people that let's say the, the the eldership needs to all be fired. There is a personality that just thrives on creating as much chaos and ill will yeah. as possible. Yeah, because they're the ones stirring it so that that makes them at least feel like they're in control. Because I'm the one doing all the lying. Mm -hmm. And I got these people believe in this, and these people believe in that. I just watched a film over Christmas, uh, Ford versus Ferrari. I don't know whether you saw it. But no, but I've seen it. It's a good film. Um, and it's it really uh, looks at the history of um, Carol Shelby, who's the American you're probably familiar with, Racing Cobra. Shelby Cobra. Shelby Racing, basically. He won the, he was the first and maybe the only American in Wigan recent times to win the Le Mans 24 hour race, which is a grueling race on, on basically just road, normal roads. Not, it's not on a bank circuit or anything. It's close to city, you put up some hay bale. Yeah, it's a bit like the Isle of Man TT bike race. Uh, but uh, anyway, Ken Miles was a great racer, but he was a great mechanic. I mean, he, he could turn an engine of a car on it. He, he just knew it was as if it was an animal he was riding or something. Um, very, very good film, but there was a guy in the Ford Corporation. Uh, Ford tried to buy Ferrari because they were bust. They'd won the Le Mans for like five years on the trot, but mm -hmm. in doing so, they'd run out of money. So Ford tried to buy them and they got snubbed uh, by Enzo Ferrari. And he didn't like it. He went and sold out to uh, Fiat, to Gianni and Yali instead. Well, that created uh, loggerheads between Henry Ford II, who was running Ford back in the 60s. <laughs> and they said, so we're going racing. Um, Lee Iacocca uh, helped set everything up. But the guy who's uh, Ford's trusted advisor is a fellow called Beebe, I forgot his first name. And he is a manipulator. He manipulates Henry Ford and he thinks, Ford thinks this is good for the company, but it's not, it's only good for Mr. Beebe. And uh, he keeps stopping uh, he, he, in one Le Mans deal. Ken Miles and Carol Shelby do all the work on this Ford GT40 uh, that they're going to race there. Uh, and he does all the work. He gets a car that can actually beat a Ferrari. And then on the eve of them going to France, um, BB says, no, you're not coming, Ken Miles, you're not going. Mm. So he doesn't get to race. Well, they didn't win and their gearbox is all blue and nothing finished and it was a disaster. Well, the next year, uh, Henry Ford says to Carol Shelby, you report only to me, not to any of my 15 tiers of management or anything, just to me. So they go thinking that, okay, Ken Miles is going to get to race this time. When they take three teams, three cars, and uh, they end up beating Ferrari and they, they come in one, two, and three. Well, Ken Miles is way ahead. And Beebe says to Henry Ford, oh, you 
know what, wouldn't it look great in the newspapers if the cars all finished, you know, kind of level with each other over the finish line so they see four, 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 one, two, three. Well, Ford buys it and uh, eventually uh, it, what happens is Ken Miles slows down. From right, for the right because the other two, they are one, two, and three. Right? And they come in level on the line almost. And one, nobody two, wins? Well, no, but Ken Miles doesn't win because the rules, the, the Le Mans race starts by everybody. The cars are like this parallel on the, on the uh, start grid. Hmm. And the racers have to run from the start position to their cars. Well, Bruce McLaren, who's driving one of the um, Fords, is nearer the back of the grid. So he actually had to travel further to get to the finish line in the end, is how they did it. Beebe knew that. And so Ken Miles actually didn't win. He was classed as second, even though he won by a mile. But um, yeah, so. BB just snubbed it all. Just meanness. Maybe, yeah, just meanness. Maybe not quite a perfect example of someone like Doig, but you know, someone who's a manipulator and a, you know, and he, he classed it all in the terms of this is you need to be a Ford man. This is what Ford does. And so was this the McLaren that later built the McLaren F1? Yeah, well he died, but he started the McLaren um, Empire. Bruce McLaren was killed. Just a couple of years later, Ken Miles died as well. A lot of people were killed who were in racing in those days. So it wasn't as safe for the designers as they are today. Well, it's racing. <laughs> it's racing. Not, that's kind of. But it's a good one. film, and, yeah. and you yeah. enjoy watching it. It's uh, it's very good. But yeah, he's a he's a pretty objectionable guy. Because uh, if it had been left to Lee Iacocca, who was the one who came up with it, we need to go racing. Thing, uh, it would have been a different story. Yeah. Anyway. Wow.